Today we are going to study control systems. Now what do we actually mean by a control system? Control system, as we can see, comprises of two different words. One is the control and one is the system. Now first, let us consider a few examples. If you say system, the word system to a layman, what comes to his mind? Maybe a fan? His laptop? AC machine? Yes, there are systems indeed. But if you think deeply, a fan with no blade is basically useless. You are definitely not going to buy a computer which doesn't even start off or which doesn't even have its RAM. So, we can technically think that a system a system is something that can give us a desired output that is we can get what we exactly want from the system now coming to the other part that's the control part now you have a fan and, uh, and during the winter season suppose you want to start off the fan at say some one or two and the fan doesn't have a regulator it goes on in the full speed you definitely won't be liking it similarly in other cases you might be getting the desired output but then there should be a mechanism in which you can control that output to suit your various needs. Like in a AC machine, if we can't operate it at various temperatures of air, then basically it doesn't serve much of its purpose, although it classifies its basic requirement as a system. So what we need along with the thing being a system is something called control. Hence, the term control system comes into picture. So we can see a control system predominantly has two parts. Let's see what are they. This would be a very basic control system. Here we can see we have the input. Here we have a summer. I will come to the summer later. Here we have the system. Now this system output is basically fed in a form of a loop to the adder, adder I mentioned before. Now the input is fed from here. It comes and the output signal is fed through this loop. There is some addition or subtraction depending upon the feedback mechanism and this modified signal is again fed to the system. This way it establishes a control over the output. Now let us take a few examples. Suppose you have a temper suppose you have a temperature control device. Okay. And we want to operate it at a temperature of say 40 degrees centigrade. The system processes the signal and at the output, instead of 40 degrees centigrade, we start getting 42 or maybe 41 degrees centigrade. Now what happens? Below 40 degrees centigrade, this feedback mechanism remains, keeps its mouth shut. That is, it doesn't function. As soon as we cross over 40, that's 41, maybe 40.5, what happens? This 40.5 is fed to this feedback feedback loop. Here it compares with the predefined the predefined output. That is, this output should, signal should be less than equal to 40 degrees centigrade. 
If it is less than equal to, the feedback doesn't generate any kind of a signal. If it is not, if the output signal is greater than 40, then what happens is this. The feedback mechanism generates a negative going signal which subtracts the dummy input signals in such a way that the signal when fed to the system in the second cycle basically gives an output which is less than 40 degree, 40 degree or equal to 40 degree centigrade. Now this kind of an actuation may or may not be done in a single cycle. Sometimes it requires several cycles for this loop to go on till we have this actuation at 40 degree centigrade. This is the importance of a control system. That is a system whose output is fed back to the input of the system in such a manner that the output is reasonably controlled. I hope so far the things are pretty clear. Next we come Now, I had mentioned about something called feedback. Now from the term it's pretty clear, a feedback is something that is, that, that is being sent back to the original input. Now feedback as you can see, can be of two types. It can be positive feedback, it can be negative feedback. Now what do we mean by positive feedback? Positive feedback, if we think, maybe in a layman's perspective as well. A positive is someone which adds to the signal or adds to something. So the previous example that I took, from 40 degrees centigrade, it adds on to the 40 degrees centigrade, next is 41, next cycle 42, then 43, 44 and so on. In a negative feedback is actually where the actuation and other control mechanism takes place. So when the output signal shoots over the 40, then it's the negative feedback that comes into picture and brings it down below or equal to 40. So in order to have a proper control system or rather a stable control system, A stable control system, we need a negative feedback. Now, let us take an uh, example, few examples of some basic systems. In networks we have seen a basic system for an RC circuit. Let us first see what the circuit is all about. Now before, here we can see it comprises of an R and C, R and C, when the, while the output is taken from the C. Now before that, let us, for any kind of control system mechanism, we have something called a lapras. This Laplace is nothing but when we work in the frequency domain that is in something called an S domain it's, it's called a Laplace transform. So for this circuit the Laplace transform of the Laplace transform of the entire circuit would be That is, the Laplace of the capacitor is 1 by Cs, 
and the Laplace of the capacitor is 1 by Cs while that of the resistor is R only. So the output by the input in the Laplace domain is 1 by Cs divided by R plus 1 by Cs. Now this parameter V0 by Vi is, is called a transfer function. Now what do we mean by a transfer function then? Transfer function in simple words is the ratio of the output in the Laplace domain that is V naught S and the to the rate through that of the input in the S domain that is V i S. So V naught S and V V divided by V i S gives me the transfer function of this entire RC network. So let us first take a few examples of the transfer functions. I will draw some circuits on the board and you work it out on yourself what the transfer functions would be and then we shall try and solve whether the answers you have got is right or wrong. Okay. So these are the two examples. Now first try to solve them out. This circuit has one inductor L and we get the output from the resistor R. For this circuit, we have inductor L connected in series with a capacitor that's C1 and we get the output from the second capacitor that's the C2. Now, Try to solve them out and let us see what the answer works out. Okay, so let us see now what the answer for this one is. First step Laplace transform of the output divided by input. So it's It's V naught S divided by V I S. Now we get the output from the resistor. The Laplace transform of a resistor is nothing but R. There is no frequency domain to a resistor. So it's R. So by using by using simple voltage divider rule, what we get is R divided by R plus LS, that is Laplace of the resistance divided by the total impedance, that is the Laplace of S L plus, plus Laplace of R, R by R plus LS. This is what we get. So I hope the every one of you have got the first answer correct. It's R divided by R plus LS. Now let us now let us come to the second problem. The second problem is a bit complex because it has both the capacitance and the inductance parameter into picture. 
बस इवेंट लेटर्स को स्टेप बाय स्टेप स्टेप वन व्हाट डू बी लैपटॉप ऑफ आउटपुट यू आर डिवाइडेड बाय लैपटॉप ऑफ इनपुट So what will be the Laplace of output for a capacitor? It's one by C S. In this case, one by C two S because the capacitor we are dealing is basically C two. And according to voltage division rule, it will be divided by the total impedance of the circuit. That is one by C two S plus One by C one S plus one by not one by plus L S. This is what we should be getting. So for this circuit. The transfer function works out to be something for this. We can we can find further simplify this thing to get a much simplified answer. So I am leaving this thing up to you. In this answer is also technically correct. If we can simplify that, even better. Now in the transfer functions, well, we did the three examples of the transfer functions. We must have seen one thing. Let us observe that thing. these are my two circuits as you can see these are my two circuits for the first circuit what we have we have one capacitor one resistor so what does the transfer function works out to be now if we take this now if we take this example what is it has got one inductor l and one capacitor c for this the transfer function will be yeah yeah it will be 1 by cs divided by ls plus 1 by cs right let me just if we if we further simplify this thing we get something like this for this circuit this is the transfer function for this circuit this is the sum transfer function now if we observe it minutely or if we go into the behavior of our resistor capacitor and inductor we find 
basically a resistor is used where we want to dissipate the signal that is for some signal loss or something like that a resistor is used but on the other hand a capacitor and an inductor is used for the for something called a memory as a memory device that is we can store a, store a signal in a inductor as well as a capacitor so an inductor and a capacitor we can term as memory elements now in the first circuit we notice that we have only one capacitor while in the second circuit we can see we have two memory devices one inductor one capacitor coming back to the transfer function here we see in the denominator of the transfer function the maximum power in case of a single capacitor circuit maximum power of s is 1 maximum power of s is 1 why in the second circuit where there are two memory elements the maximum power of s in the denominator is 2 from here we can conclude that in the denominator the maximum power of s the maximum power of s in the denominator is actually equal to the number of memory elements in the circuit so if in a in the gate exam if a one mark question comes a very com very complex kind of a transfer function is given see i will give you an example of such a transfer function suppose something some transfer arbitrary transfer function like this is given a very complex one and the options are the what are the number of memory elements in the circuit the options can be these can be the four options so as we have previously seen here number of memory elements in a circuit is nothing but the maximum power of s in the denominator which is 40 so the answer is nothing but c so that we can that's basically a shortcut of getting those one mark questions